everybody. Welcome to Guided Listening This Week. I'm Jeff Antoniak. So glad you're here. So this week, we're going to be listening to the great Herbie Hancock and his band, uh, and this is from the Maiden Voyage album. The song is Dolphin Dance. Uh, it's an incredible band. It's Herbie Hancock on uh, piano, Freddie Hubbard on trumpet, George Coleman on tenor saxophone, Ron Carter on bass, Tony Williams on drums. Not going to get any better than that, right? It's such a beautiful song. It's so flowing. It's so lovely. Uh, and it's so freaking hard. Uh, any jazz musicians out there, you know what I'm talking about. It's a brilliant tune, and there's a lot more in there than uh, we could imagine. So we're going to listen in and see how the band is handling some of these situations. Now, this is a tune that we're working on in the blue community inside Jazzwire. I know many of you have heard me talk about Jazzwire. Um, I would love for you to take the free trial. You've heard me say that too. And you know what? Um, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I was, I had a couple openings for private lessons, two openings for private lessons. I got a lot more than two responses for private lessons. I really appreciate that. And I'm sorry there's some of you that I can't get to. But of course, you can work with me 24 seven on Jazzwire, as well as the rest of the faculty. So um, it's a way where you don't have to commute. It's uh, a lot less expensive than individual private lessons and all that. So I hope you check out Jazzwire and uh, check out the free trial. This, is, uh, this week will be our third lesson on this song. So we're really digging into some of the harmony. Today, I wanna listen to it and, uh, and check out some of what's going on. It's an interesting tune. I, I never really thought about it this way, but there's actually in the form, in one time through the form, there are five instances, I want to say, of pedal tones where the bass, Ron Carter, um, written in by Herbie Hancock, is staying on one note as the chords are changing above that note. That gives it a very impressionistic feel or just a sort of floating, otherworldly, whatever kind of feel. Now, we've heard pedal tones going back to Baroque music and before. I mean, I guess maybe we could argue Gregorian chant. Pedal tones have been around a long time but they still have this very interesting feel. Um, so, and, and it creates a challenge because there's these shifting harmonies over a static bass note. That's what a pedal tone is. The word pedal literally comes from the organ pedals. Those were the bass notes. They didn't have Ron Carter back in the day. So the, the organ player, when they stood on one of those pedals and held it down and things happening on top of the pedal, a pedal tone, it's a particular compositional device. Playing over those as a jazz improviser can be interesting, it can be liberating, but in this instance, there's a lot going on. So let's just jump in, let's listen a little bit. Uh, and there, there's, it's, what can I say, it's wonderful, let's go. A little four measure intro. And we're into the tune. So I often talk about the feel of the bass and the drums. So listen to Ron Carter. What is the feel that he's playing? It's jazz, but deeper than that. He's playing a two feel. He's playing essentially half notes. Let's call them ornamented half notes on B1 and 3. And yes, he's playing fills. He's playing other things, but the fills are relative to 1 and 3. Still, um, um, um. Very strict one and three. What's Tony doing on drums? He's actually not playing the more broken two feel. He's swinging. It's interesting. So Tony has chosen to swing in a four feel as Ron's playing in a two feel. It's not the first time that's happened, but a lot of drummers would play less than Tony's playing here. Here's the end of the melody, this little extension. Pedal tone again. Now listen to Tony. So it jumps ahead and feel, right? Ron starts walking, but Tony didn't really materially change his playing. So it was Ron Carter that added this propulsion that wasn't in the head. Ready, Hubbard. Here's one of those pedal sections. And Freddie was kind of playing through. As the chords were changing, he found some common notes that worked between those harmonies. It's an interesting strategy. And 
Freddie can play so energetically, so swinging, but he can also really sort of float with his ideas. So here he's playing bebop, post bop, right? Here he hangs back a little bit. These tricky chord changes, the last four, but he's kind of building up some energy for this next chorus, second chorus. Going back and forth between a double time 16th note feel and 8th notes. And triplets in there too. Lots of rhythmic variation. And that ba 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 ba. Freddie's using a lot of repeated notes. Okay, if you're an improviser, note to self. Not a bad approach, right? More of those triplets there. That's cool. And the tune is floating, beautiful, impressionistic, but here it's swinging, right? There's nothing impressionistic about this. Maybe the harmony, the way it's floating. And interesting, the next solo starts four measures before the traditional end of the form, top. That's pretty interesting. Ooh, and what happens with Ron? Ron's now in the two feel again. He brought it back and listen to Tony. He's playing with more space than he has in the whole song, including the head in. So Tony's playing more impressionistically. He's playing time, but very broken time. So this is a great lesson for drummers that want to experiment with broken time. Here we go, exhibit A. Swinging, right? Really change the feel of. And here's another pedal section. It's cool arpeggios from George Coleman. Another pedal section. But the pedal is kind of building some energy going to the second chorus. And I love what Tony did there. If you listen back, and I'm not talking, Ron started building some energy, and Tony laid out. So it was this weird, like, are we going or not? And then when Tony came in, it started driving. Tony was famous for that idea of using dynamics in his ride cymbal, like unexpectedly soft, and then going for it, or just stopping playing. Man, awesome. It's comping. What a cool comping rhythm, right? He was comping quarter note triplets in groupings of five. So he was playing groupings of five as he was playing rhythmic groupings of three over four, four. Slick. Next solo. Four measures early. And did you hear how Herbie came in answering uh, George Coleman was doing sort of a tremolo or a trill, Herbie came in with the same thing. Very slick. <laughs> Listen to the feel. Tony's barely playing. And now he comes in stronger. A great example of, uh, of how Tony deals with dynamics. One of the loudest drummers of all time and one of the softest drummers of all time. Mm. And Herbie is a master of this difficult harmony that he wrote for us. There's that tremolo repeated note idea again that we've heard from lots of the players, all of the soloists so far. <coughs> Motivic. Ba -ba -da, ba -ba -da, ba -ba -da. How many times did Herbie play that? Boo ba ba da, boo ba ba da, boo ba ba da. Six, eight, twelve? Motivic playing. Lesson to us. And 
now, it's romping, man. It is swinging now, right? Think about where we started, where Tony was barely playing, Ron was in a very light two feel. Man, this is a great rhythm section. This is why this is a great rhythm section. Not just because they have the names they have. This is why they're great. Mm. Great loping polyrhythm over top. I love this line. It's my favorite part of the whole tune, that one little line towards the end of his second chorus. Love that melody. Motivic. Beautiful. Back to that little intro melody played over the end of the form, kind of complicated. And here we are on the head out. Let's listen to the feel. So it's very much like at the beginning. Tony could be playing less. He played less in a lot of the solos, but he's kind of chose to drive it ahead as Ron's in two. That's an interesting decision. I love it. One of the pedal tones. Listen down, you can hear the repeated bass notes. And you can hear how Tony is catching that. Ba da da. Ba da da. Ba da da da. He didn't do that on the head end. That's something they invented together, him and Ron, in that moment. Now we're eight from the end of the tune with this pedal. And it just stays here. It never gets to the last four measures of the form. Horn players are out. And so it kind of just ends on that pedal tone. All right. We listen to that and it's, uh, it's so easy, it's so swinging, it's so relaxed, it's so lovely. All those things are true. And, um, you know, trust me, if, uh, if you're not a musician yourself, if you haven't tried playing this song, it's a legendary uh, butt kicker, let's call it. Legendary butt kicker. Not a bad name for an album, but um, yeah, it, it, it's a big deal. There's a lot going on inside here, and we spend a lot of time trying to learn how to play this tune. And just, you know, we listened a lot to the bass and the drums and some moments of comping too, right? And you know, if you're a jazz fan, you're used to knowing that Tony Williams is great. Maybe you're not sure why, but he played with Miles and whatever. Were you, you know, Ron Carter is still around sounding so great. We're used to knowing these people are legends, but sometimes we're not quite sure why they're legends or, you know, what? This is a great example of, um, of playing that is so connected, so emotional, so serving the music, but there wasn't a lot about it that was chops heavy. Tony Williams could be super chops heavy. He would play astounding, impossible things on the drums. We're not hearing that here. We're hearing an incredible artist using subtlety in the moment. And sometimes not so subtle, right? But it wasn't a big chops fest. So this tune really demands a lot from us. And I'm not sure that playing this tune in a way where we're using tons of technique even makes sense. We heard Freddie Hubbard play lots of great double time and, you know, going for some of that great Freddie Hubbard stuff, but still he knew to play this song for what it was, not to turn it into, you know, some sort of weird high, fast, loud trumpet concerto or something. So, yep. Okay. Well, as I said, if you want to know more about this, if you're a player, come into Jazzwire and uh, check out the three lessons we did on this song. We have hundreds and hundreds of these lessons on various songs inside Jazzwire. And sure, lessons on songs, that's good, that's important. We could imagine somebody paying for that. Jazzwire, what makes Jazzwire different than every other platform out there are the conversations, the community. When I went to the University of North Texas, yeah, I got lessons, I took classes, I read books, some people handed me out stuff and I learned it. That's not remotely the important thing about going to North Texas or Indiana or Berkeley or wherever. The important thing are the people that you learn that stuff with, the conversations you have, people at your level, people above who you're looking up to. That is what you pay for when you go to Harvard Business School, right? That's what you pay for when you go to North Texas. So 
That's the experience I created inside Jazzwire. It's not just the information, the information's important, but it's how we process the information and how we support you. So I want you to come in, take a look around, and uh, I hope I'll be working with you inside Jazzwire. Dolphin Dance, recommend it to your friends. All right, take care, everybody.